It's black, it's sleek, and no, you did not click on my X395 review by accident. This machine is something else. Ladies and gentlemen, say hello to the ThinkPad X13, the X395 successor, and it's one of the most powerful Ultrabooks in the world. So first impressions, and well, this doesn't look any different than its predecessor, at all. In fact, I looked up the dimensions of both these laptops and they have the exact same size and even weight. It seems like they use the same chassis, but that's no bad thing, because it feels well-built, sturdy, and premium, even if it doesn't look particularly interesting. It's sort of like the Volkswagen Golf of laptops. They're everywhere and people will pass by one without batting an eye, but they'll know that you are a no-nonsense and efficient individual. Having the same chassis as the X395, it features a fingerprint reader for easier sign-ins, which is surprisingly much faster than the previous model, a replaceable spill-resistant keyboard, and a broad selection of ports, with two USB 3.1 Gen 1 Type A's, two USB 3.1 Gen 2 Type C's with DisplayPort and power delivery, one HDMI 2.0, one audio combo jack, a mini ethernet port, an optional smart card reader, and even the weirdly placed micro SD card reader, which you can use to fit a nano SIM card for LTE, in case you need internet access on the go. You also have the classic ThinkPad webcam shutter, which you can use to cover or reveal the webcam, which is a nice privacy feature I wish more laptops had. The 720p webcam is fine, it looks about as good as you can expect from a laptop. It's clear and colorful enough for video calls, and the mic provides enough detail in my voice. You can get an optional IR camera for Windows Hello facial recognition, but I think most of you will be happy with the fingerprint sensor on this model as it works almost instantly. Typing experience is another strong point. The keyboard was comfortable to type on, the keys had a nice weight and springiness to them that offered good resistance against accidental presses, while not being too tiresome to press over long periods, and the keys had a good 1.7mm of travel for a satisfying typing experience. The keyboard is also backlit, and you can change between two brightness levels using FN and Spacebar. I like how the lighting takes its time to change brightness. It doesn't turn on immediately to dazzle you like every other backlit keyboard, but it does so gradually to give you enough time to adjust, which I think is a nice touch. The keyboard layout itself is the same as your average 13 to 14 inch ThinkPad, with no numpad and direct access to the snipping tool using the FN and print screen keys. Overall, a near standard layout except for the swapped FN and control keys, which might be hard for some to adjust to when coming from a normal keyboard, but a viewer has told me that you can change the layout in the BIOS, so if you're having trouble adjusting, you do have that option. The track point may also be an issue for some when typing, since you might graze your finger and miss a keystroke by accident but it does have its uses. I've received some very interesting insights from viewers on how the track point works for them, and although I'm still not very precise with it, I do enjoy the functionality of moving your cursor without needing to take your hands off the keyboard. It was especially helpful when I was writing the review for this while browsing through some web pages and switching windows. In case you don't like the track point though, you'll have a good time with this trackpad. It's a good size without being too large where it gets in the way of your palms. It has a smooth surface that was easy to glide my fingers across even when sweaty, and gestures work nicely too. The integrated trackpad button was fine, but clicking needs a bit more force than I'd like. Plus, it gets increasingly harder to click as you get to the top, with the upper two-thirds of the trackpad being completely unclickable. The buttons above the trackpad are much nicer to use though. They need very little force to press, and they make a nice, satisfying sound that isn't too loud. Now let's move on to the screen. My model comes with the same matte 1080p 60Hz IPS display from LG as the previous model, and it's great for this kind of laptop. Images are crisp on this display thanks to its pixel density of 166 ppi, and topping out at 300 nits, this should be bright enough for outdoor use within a reasonably shaded area. For usage in direct sunlight though, you'd be better off going with the optional 500 1080p screen, which also comes with a privacy guard filter for when you're looking at those top secret business documents. Viewing angles are excellent, though they won't be for the privacy guard screen for obvious reasons. This panel also provides vibrant colors covering 96% of the sRGB color space, which will be handy for creative work, though the more professional view might be disappointed with the limited Adobe RGB coverage of 61%. 
The contrast ratio of about 2000 to 1 is great for an IPS panel, especially when viewed in the dark, because combined with the minimal IPS glow and no perceptible backlight bleed, the panel can produce deep and uniform blacks. Its only downside is that its 50 millisecond gray to gray response time is quite slow, as you can see by the huge blur produced by this chase motion test. But then again, no one is going to be playing games competitively on this, so I don't think this would bother anyone. What might be more bothersome though are the downward facing speakers. These can sound muffled at times, and while music can fill a room, dialogue might be a little difficult to hear with some background noise. Here's what an episode of The Good Place sounds like at 100% volume. You know how some people pull into the breakdown lane when there's traffic, and they think to themselves, ah, who cares, no one's watching. We were watching. Surprise! It doesn't sound bad, but it does lack some detail compared to other laptop speakers I've heard. The main issue here though is volume, but if you have a good pair of headphones, this really won't be a big deal. Another deficiency that was carried over to this generation is the over-tightened hinge, which means you won't be able to open this laptop with one hand. The RAM is also still soldered, which isn't ideal, but at least you can get it with 32 gigs from the get-go, which wasn't possible with its predecessor. It's easy to get to the SSD as well. All you need to do is loosen five captive screws, pry the panel open, and there you go. Really, the problems we've seen so far are minor inconveniences at most, because when you consider everything else, this has been a solid laptop so far. It ticks almost every box. Exceptional build quality and materials, a vibrant screen, a wide port selection, and a pleasing typing experience. Honestly though, I wasn't expecting much different, because save for the little X13 badge on the right side, it is essentially a carbon copy of the X395. However, this is where the similarities end, because inside it is a vastly different beast. This 13 inch 1.3 kilogram laptop has a 6 core 12 thread Ryzen 5 Pro 4650U with integrated Vega 6 graphics, which by the way uses the new 7 nanometer Vega architecture, so it'll be faster than the Vega 6 on a Zen Plus CPU like the Ryzen 3 3300U. It also has 16 gigs of DDR4 3200, a 512 gig Samsung PM981A NVMe SSD, and an Intel AX200 Wi-Fi module which provides dual band AX Wi-Fi and Bluetooth 5.1. In terms of configurations, this is the mid-range model which retails for about 1400 US dollars. The range kicks off with a 4 core 8 thread Ryzen 3 Pro 4450U, 8 gigs of DDR4 3200, and a 128 gig NVMe SSD for 800 US dollars. But you can spec it up to a freaking 8 core 16 thread Ryzen 7 Pro 4750U, 32 gigs of DDR4 3200, and a 1 terabyte NVMe SSD for about $2000. And being Lenovo, this model is configurable, so you get the exact laptop you want. Now, this generation of Ryzen Pro laptop processors are quite different from last generation, where each Ryzen Pro CPU was basically a non-pro, or as I like to call it, amateur Ryzen CPU with a few extra security features added. But not so anymore. The 4750U's closest amateur counterpart is the 4800U, but that's clocked slightly higher and comes with one more graphics core. R4650U is identical to the 4600U, but the 4450U's amateur counterpart is oddly non-existent. The closest thing to this 4-core 8-thread part in terms of performance would be the 6-core 6 6-thread 6 Ryzen 5 4500U. And if I could take a brief side note, what is with this amateur Ryzen 4000U lineup? Unlike Pro CPUs which all have hyperthreading, there are amateur Ryzen 5s and 7s both with and without hyperthreading, but the hyperthreaded Ryzen 5s and 7s are almost nowhere to be seen in the market. I'm also confused as to why both an 8-core 8 8-thread 8 and a 6-core 12-thread processor exists in their range, because as you'll see later, the multi-core performance of a 6-core 12-thread CPU parallels that of an 8-core 8 8-thread 8 part. Strange. Anyway, now let's move on to how this machine feels to use, and it should really be no surprise that it's snappy, responsive, and smooth. It took heavy multitasking like a champ, breezing through several open programs, documents, and Chrome tabs. 
Our AX Wi-Fi module provides quick upload and download speeds, and our SSD was one of the fastest 500 gig Gen 3 SSDs I've tested, with a blistering sequential read and write speed of 3600 and 3000 megabytes per second respectively. Battery life from the 48 watt hour battery was also good. I averaged about five to six hours every day, which is miles off Lenovo's estimate of about 12 hours, but I was doing heavy multitasking at maximum brightness with the power mode at better performance. This is like what I had with the X395, but it's even more impressive when you consider how much more powerful this thing is. Like the X395, you can set custom charging limits within the Lenovo Vantage software if you want to extend your battery's lifespan, and it can be charged from 0 to 80% in just an hour using rapid charge over the included 65 watt AC adapter, which is convenient. All right. Now let's see what this laptop can really do with some benchmarks. benchmarks. So let's start our first set of tests with PC Mark 10, a complete PC benchmarking software that tests your entire system in a variety of situations. PC Mark 10 results are divided into three subcategories, but unfortunately I couldn't find any 4650 laptop benchmarks on 3 d Mark site to compare this against. So we're instead comparing it to the average laptop equipped with a Ryzen 5 4600U, which is identical to the 4650U aside from the security features, so it should serve as a fair comparison. Our system seems to be performing better in every category, leading in essentials, productivity, and content creation by about 24, 21, and 6.4% respectively, resulting in an overall score that's about 14% higher than the average 4600U laptop. The next test we have is 3 d Mark Time Spy, a DirectX 12 benchmark that tests both the CPU and GPU. And our laptop is slower than the average 4600U laptop in all categories this time around. Our Vega 6 is about 6.2% slower than the average Vega 6, while our 4650U is 7.2% slower than the average 4600U, giving us an overall rating that's about 6.2% slower than the average 4600U notebook. In 3D Mark Firestrike, a DirectX 11 benchmark, the X13 leads by about 1.7% in graphics, 3.5% in physics, and 1% for the combined score. All these are within margin of error, which means our system is roughly equal to the average 4600U laptop in this test. Seems like in the more graphically intensive tests, our system falls very slightly short of the average 4600U laptop, but for the more CPU-centric workloads like PC Mark 10, the X13 manages to edge it out slightly. Now that we know how this laptop performs for its spec, let's see how the CPU performs compared to other models, starting with the single-threaded CPU benchmarks. In Cinebench R15 and R20, thanks to higher boost clocks and an IPC advantage, the 4650U outperforms the old 3500U by about 26%. It also manages to match every other Intel CPU here, including the i7-10750H, which is supposedly capable of boosting to 5GHz. The 4700U and 4750U both perform about the same as the 4650U here, as they are also Zen 2 chips that have similar boost clocks. In Geekbench 5, the Intel CPU results are a bit more dispersed, but the general trend remains the same, with the 4650U and all other Zen 2 CPUs having Intel-level single-core performance, with the older 3500U being left in the dust. Where it gets real exciting is in the multi-threaded test. Now, I ran these tests 10 times on the X13, and somehow, in Cinebench R15 and R20, our 4650U is almost twice as fast as the old 3500U, and even the quad-core i7-10610U, though the 1065G7 catches up a bit thanks to its newer 10 nanometer architecture. The 4650U also manages to outperform the 6-core i7-10710U by about 7.4% in R15 and 15% in R20, and that's currently Intel's most powerful U-series CPU. The 4750U, though, is in a league of its own, managing a sizable 20% lead over the 4650U to match the 10750H in this test. It's a similar story in Geekbench 5, where our 4650U is almost twice as fast as a 3500U, about the same as the 4700U, and faster than every Intel chip, aside from the 10750H, which is to be expected, having a higher power limit, and consequently being able to maintain a higher all-core boost clock for longer. So how exactly does the CPU behave under an all-core load? Well, here I have Hardware Info 64 graphing CPU temperature, clock speed, and current TDP with the CPU-Z stress test running in the background. 
we have a brief spike of 3.2 GHz on all cores at 20 watts for a few seconds, then the CPU limits itself to reach a TDP of 18 watts, maintaining 3 GHz on all cores as temperatures gradually increase. After about 5 minutes, the temperature stabilizes at 88 degrees, at which point it starts downclocking itself again to reach a final TDP limit of 15 watts, where it maintains 2.8 GHz on all cores at 80 degrees. Not too shabby. Okay, that's enough of the CPU tests. Now let's see how our Vega 6 performs. This chart shows the 3 d Mark Time Spy graphics score of several GPUs, and here you can really see the advantage of the new 7 nanometer Vega architecture, with our Vega 6 outperforming the old Vega 8 by about 15%, even with its 2 core disadvantage. The UHD 630 and 620 are pretty much gone, with the Vega 6 leading by 66 and 101% respectively. Though Intel's not taking this line down anymore, because the Iris Plus G7 graphics found in their 10 nanometer CPUs seems to hold its own against the outgoing Vega 8. The new Vega 7 and Vega 8, though, offer a significant lead of about 30% over the Vega 6 to match Nvidia's own MX250, and that's a dedicated graphics card, which makes it even more impressive. Firestrike produces a similar distribution, with the Vega 6 faster than the old Vega 8 and Intel's G7 graphics, but slower than the new Vega 7 and Vega 8. Though in this test, the new Vega 8 shows a larger 37% performance increase over the Vega 6. Now let's see how that performance translates to games, starting with GTA 5. On the left, you can see the MSI Afterburner overlay with CPU temperature, usage, and clock speed, GPU temperature, usage, and clock speed, along with our current TDP and frame rate. Here I am doing my normal thing of shooting things and blowing stuff up. I'm playing at 720p at the lowest settings, and we are doing very well with an average of 63 FPS with a 1% low of 23 and a 0.1% low of 13. Given our performance at 720p is so good, what about 1080p? Well, we don't get 60 FPS, but we still have decent frame rates for a third person game, with an average of 46, a 1% low of 25, and a 0.1% low of 16. Next up, Modern Warfare, and I'm playing Hardpoint on shipment for Maximum Chaos. At the lowest settings and render resolution, we're getting surprisingly good frame rates considering how many explosions are happening, with an average of 39 FPS, a 1% low of 11, and a 0.1% low of 2.4. The 1% lows aren't really that bad though, because they're just stutters that happen during respawns. The next game we have is Apex Legends, and here you can see me flanking the enemy and then catching them completely off guard with one of the coolest kills I've ever done. Didn't see that coming, hmm? Anyway, this was played on low settings at 720p, and performance is great with an average of 50 FPS, a 1% low of 24, and a 0.1% low of 19. And finally, we have Monster Hunter World, and here you see me absolutely shredding this poor guy. At 720p with the lowest settings, we average a very playable 43 FPS with a 1% low of 18 and a 0.1% low of 8. Obviously, these numbers aren't even close to rivaling gaming laptops, but they're respectable nonetheless, especially considering the main problem of the X395 was its graphics performance. Basically, when the old 3500U hit its 17 watt TDP limit, both CPU and the Vega 8 graphics were downclocked, which heavily affected gaming performance. It could only be addressed by using Ryzen controller to manually adjust the TDP to 27 watts, which worsened temperature significantly. However, it seems like Ryzen 4000 series CPUs use an algorithm to regulate power sharing between the CPU and GPU, which means in games, for example, the 4650U allocates a larger power budget to the Vega 6, whereas the old 3500U would probably just split them evenly. In fact, there's no discernible frame rate difference for when the CPU is at its 18 watt limit or its 15 watt limit, which is great to see. This begs the question though, how would the 4650U cope when both its CPU and graphics cores were stressed at the same time? Well, on the screen, I'm running a CPU-Z stress test along with a Heaven benchmark to do just that, along with Hardware Info 64 graphing CPU temperature, clock speed, GPU temperature, clock speed, and current TDP. Within the first 18 watt TDP limit, our CPU maintains 2.6 GHz on all 6 cores, and our Vega 6 maintains about 700 to 800 MHz, while our CPU temperatures stabilize at 80 degrees, which isn't bad. Here you can see how under both CPU and GPU load, the 4650U splits its power budget both ways, with a bias towards the CPU. Because while the CPU is only maintaining about a 400MHz lower clock speed, the Vega 6 is running at about half its boost clock, 
Under normal conditions, it's actually capable of 1500 megahertz. After a few minutes when it transitions to the final 15 watt TDP limit, you can clearly see the 4650U downclocking both CPU and GPU cores. The APU ends up maintaining about 2.4 GHz on the CPU and 650 MHz on the GPU at 73 degrees, which is excellent. Exterior temperatures were just as good with the keyboard deck and palm rest staying warm at most, with the only real hotspot being the area directly above the exhaust vent. I also did feel a bit of exhaust heat when my hand was about 10 centimeters away from the vent. The fan though was really quiet even during the stress test, which is great. Before we end the stress test, let's see how my theory about that power sharing algorithm holds up. To do that, we must answer just one question. How does the Vega 6 behave when we stop stressing the CPU? And would you look at that? The 4650U still maintains a 15 watt TDP, but it significantly downclocks its CPU cores to about 1.4 GHz to give the Vega 6 some room to stretch its legs, as it maintains its full boost clock of 1500 MHz. This is also accompanied by a massive frame rate increase in the benchmark from about 30 to 50 FPS. Wow, there is a lot to unpack here, but suffice it to say that the performance and even the thermals were beyond my expectations. This new power sharing algorithm is one of the biggest advantages these low power Ryzen CPUs have over the previous generation, as it lets the chip perform as well as it could regardless of the situation. However, I think the biggest advantage these chips have over last gen is increased core counts and efficiency. In the past, people bought AMD laptops because they were a little bit slower than Intel, but a lot cheaper, which made them better value. But with Ryzen 4000, they're cheaper and faster at the same time. You might think though that compared to the X395 for instance, which was 750 US dollars, 1400 is a huge stretch, and 2000 US dollars for the Ryzen 7 model is eye-watering. However, this no longer targets the entry-level market alone. This specific laptop with the Ryzen 5 for $1,400 has a mid-range processor that beats Intel's best. Though there aren't many laptops with a 6-core low-power Intel CPU out there for some reason. The closest competitor to the X13 I could find was the 2019 XPS 13, which costs just $50 US dollars less at $1,350. However, you lose half your graphics performance and your SSD space, which makes it worse value despite its more attractive design. To make matters worse for Intel, it seems like the older 14 nanometer 10th gen CPUs are being phased out, because all the newest Intel thin and lights use 10 nanometer 10th gen CPUs, which do offer decent graphics performance, at least for CPUs with G7 graphics, but you're restricted to only 4 cores. I'm not sure what Intel is pulling here, because it seems like the only reason to go for an Intel Ultrabook right now is if it has a specific feature you need, like Thunderbolt 3, which currently no AMD laptops have, or perhaps the laptop's design itself is more appealing. The XPS 13 is a good example of that, being a gorgeous laptop that's Intel only. If you want power on the other hand, well it's not even a competition, especially if you get the 4750U model. I think a bigger competitor to this laptop, aside from the ThinkPad T14S, which is basically a slightly larger version of this, are laptops equipped with amateur Ryzen CPUs, such as the Acer Swift 3, which packs a 4700U in a 14-inch chassis for just 700 US dollars. As you've seen from the benchmarks, the 4700U performs as well as or slightly better than the 4650U in CPU-heavy tasks, and its Vega 7 will be better for games as well. Though its screen isn't as nice and its materials won't feel as premium, if you're someone looking for an Ultrabook that offers power on the cheap, you might be better off with something like the Swift 3. However, if you need a thin and light for creative or productive work, or if you're in the market for a high-end Ultra Portable, then the X13 is a remarkable all-rounder. It's premium, it's light, and it's one of the fastest Ultrabooks in the world in every respect. It's the whole package. Thanks for watching guys, if you liked this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up and subscribing to the channel. Please also remember to hit that bell icon next to it so you don't miss any future videos. Links to buy the X13 and its slightly larger sibling, the T14S, will be available in the description below. Post your questions, comments, thoughts, feedback, and suggestions down in the comments below, and I will see you in the next video.